So I welcome everybody to this interactive um, session organized by the African Space Leadership uh, Institute. Um, as some of us are already aware, some of the participants of the um, of the ongoing course in space law and governance are already here. Um, Ashley is the first um, space focused think tank in um, Africa. Uh, my name is Eti Young. I'm the co-founder and CEO of um, Asli. Our mission is to develop Africa's capabilities and capacity in space policy, strategy, law, governance, and leadership. And that actually stems from the work we did uh, when we were developing the African space policy and strategy. We identified gaps within the African ecosystem, and we felt that um, through the think tank, we can at least contribute to filling um, those um, gaps. So we have several things in mind, but um, at least one of the things we are doing um, strongly now is to organize different courses. In April, we had a course on space policy, and right now we are doing a course on space law and um, governance. So this open interactive session is um, kind of one of the side events of the course. And uh, we have a very excellent panel, which I will introduce um, shortly. Um, the panelists are leads in different um, AU space programs, and they've actually lectured, they have delivered lectures to the participants of the course um, in the past um, couple of um, weeks. But today we have the opportunity to interact with them, not only the participants, but also bringing in the public on Africans, uh, African citizens who want to know about Africa space programs and how uh, Africa is progressing in space. So we look forward to an excellent um, discussion and outcome. Um, the way the program will be is, I mean, kind of the structure will be uh, in the following way. Um, so first of all, I, the, I'll give the opportunity for the panelists, each of them, to give a brief overview, just with about five minutes to seven minutes of the programs that they are leading. And then after that, I'll pose uh, some questions to them. Then I'll, I'll start that. I'll now open it up for questions or comments from, um, from the participants. Um, in the course of the program, if you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to um, use um, the chat box. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, Dr. Tidian Utara is not here. Um, he is the uh, space science expert and is responsible for um, the GMES and Africa program. And maybe I should even step back a bit. The African Space um, Program, there are actually four components to it, or four priority areas. One is earth observation, then the satellite communication, um, navigation and positioning, and um, astronomy. So under the earth observation program, you have the GMES and Africa, which is the core program. But the other programs that are going on, like uh, Digital Earth Africa, Savier, but um, the one that is um, kind of implemented or coordinated by the African Union Commission is the GMS and Africa program. And Dr. Tidian Utara uh, is responsible for it, but he's not able to be, to, he's not here now. Hopefully um, the Misha, Misha Induri to who is responsible for training will be able to um, make it. Uh, then the navigation and positioning, the core program is um, SatNav Africa, which used to be, uh, it started off as um, EGNOS in Africa. Uh, Mr. Semodio will talk more, shed more light on that. Um, there's really no continental program on, on astronomy. Uh, and um, at the moment, there's no continental program on satellite communication, uh, but there's a plan coming up uh, called uh, Iris Squared. Uh, it's also funded by the EU. And we have um, Ms. Lena Paul from the European Space Policy Institute, a uh, sister institute in Europe, who is going to be um, talking to us about that, what, what the plan is about IRIS squared and um, the rollout plan and possibly where Africa will fit into it. Uh, all of us are very aware about issues about climate change. It's really a very central uh, focus within globally. Uh, so we, Afri the African Union is also kind of um, running a program called CLIMSA and uh, also funded by the EU. And we have the lead here also, Dr. Nsadi Safaka, who will be speaking to us um, about uh, the program. Uh, he has mentioned that he may have network problems because it's raining where he is. 
So I get I don't see him here now, but I think he may he will join um, later. So I I think um, without much further ado, I, maybe I should start with the programs that are currently on, that are already in operation. Uh, uh, I think the only person I see right now is Mr. Semodiov. So uh, Mr. Semodiov is the director for Southern North Africa that is based in Dakar, Senegal. You must have seen his bio uh, in the course of registering for this program. So I won't go into details about that. Uh, but so Mr. Diof, I you have the floor, please. You, you may only just talk about the South of Africa program just in brief. Thank you. Uh, thank you, team, and thank you to all my teammates uh, who are present in this panel. Um, I think this is a first a good initiative from uh, a team uh, under Asli. Uh, to join all these kind of uh, stakeholders. Uh, that's actually the first time we are really discussing between ourselves. So thank you for that. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, talk very briefly about this uh, program. Um, I think we have enough information in the website for those who want details. But what we need to retain is that our mission is really as a Pan-African specialized entity. And I say entity uh, because uh, the operationalization or institutionalization has not yet happened. Uh, so this program is to support the implementation of seamless and sustainable satellite navigation services. It is true that aviation is a main driver, but we support all sectors. So. This uh, program is championing mainly the development of GNSS, and I would add SBAS because that is a starting point, the satellite-based augmentation system in Africa, and based in one technology, the European solutions, EGNOS and Galileo. So as a component of the joint Africa-EU strategy, which we call GIS, uh, JPO uh, SATNAV Africa promotes implementation and use of these services, GNSS and ESPAS, in various market segments. This include aviation, but also agriculture, maritime, railroad, geo-information, information location-based services, and nowadays to be in, a, in, a, in, in, in the wave, uh, drones and Internet of Things. So uh, our interventions are divided into four parts, the service implementation and application development, the promotion and communication, the training and capacity building, very, very important. And we reserved for the future uh, research and development, the specific uh, support services. So as you all know, this is a, program funded under the program uh, under the framework of the Africa EU cooperation. Uh, we are hosted here by ASECNA. Uh, the program steering committee uh, is steered by AEC European Commission and African Union Commission. And to this respect, it aims really to bridge post-continent GNSS undertaking in public and private sectors, blending all these uh, international, regional and national initiatives was one goal, successful development of the NSS system and services in Africa. So this program is uh, established and uh, is mainly working through the regional economic communities, uh, the GNSS academic specialized institution, a few universities, and more recently new actors of the new space economy. So we are based here in Dakar and uh, since uh, December 2013, as I said, uh, you may visit our website if you need more information. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Diov. And um, uh, while I still have you, uh, one, one of the um, comments you made is that the purpose of the Southern of Africa is towards the development of an indigenous continent-wide um, navigation system, an SBAS system. Of course, you started off with the uh, the European EGNOS in Africa. So how, how far have we gone in terms of developing the indigenous African SBAR system? 
Okay, I think this is a very really interesting uh, question. Uh, but first of all, what I would like to share is that the African Union Commission uh, in the domain of satellite navigation has conducted a continental SBAS CBS study. Uh, I think those who have uh, looked at the video that was shown have seen that uh, this demonstrated benefits for all stakeholders whether it is in aviation, but also even the socioeconomic impact beyond uh, aviation, even our environmental con uh, benefits uh, with a uh, good uh, carbon uh, footprint. So this is just to put uh, the overall umbrella on satellite navigation with regard to ESPAS. So this is seeing the continent as one, uh, just to use a, uh, to go towards the words indigenous, uh, I would prefer a pure African, <laughs> but okay, we use uh, indigenous, so let's let's continue to use indigenous. So I'm also happy to to share with you the following um, achievement that we did in uh, Africa, and uh, I think this is very uh, important uh, to show uh, that um, first of all. Uh, apart from Northern Africa, we can see that all the regions have now good understanding of SBAS system requirements uh, because we have gone through intensive capacity building sessions and workshops across all the regional economic uh, communities, member states, experts. Uh, in West and Central Africa, we have seen also that um, the program on SBAS is moving, uh, steered by uh, what we call the uh, augmented navigation for Africa, uh, it's called ANGA program, uh, which initial service are expected uh, around 26, 28, depending on the level of the services. Eastern Africa and Southern Africa are also uh, currently evaluating the uh, supply-based augmentation uh, development. So basically all this um, is, is pushing towards uh, this, uh, this, the development of a seamless ESPA service for Africa. And most important, uh, this is developed by Africans. In other words, the choice that was done uh, was to uh, use a technology from outside. There are only two technologies, eh? the EGNOS one and the WAS one. Most of the others are using the same technology. So, we can say yes, it is indigenous because we import the technology, but we build the system together for Africa and responding to African needs. So very important uh, that this indigenous uh, continent-wide uh, navigation system is really the objective that we are following. And we can see that all the uh, regions, when I say regions, it's AU regions. They are all involved. Of course, some are moving further than the others, but what we are doing, and this is really our, our role at uh, uh, Satnav Africa, to ensure that all the initiatives to come together towards a single seamless SBAS service for Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Samodiov. And uh, if I can quickly chip in one more question also. Um, during the lecture, one of the things you mentioned in terms of um, application areas so that you work with is in, in addition to aviation, because when people talk about GNSS, what comes to mind easily or first is aviation. Well, you mentioned something about uh, your work in seismic studies. And I think this has been quite important, it's quite important now, especially with the recent earthquake in Morocco. Uh, we've also had tremors in Nigeria. Uh, so from the uh, from the from your, your point of view, from where you sit, uh, what are the present gaps in seismic studies in Africa, and um, how is Southern Africa trying to fill that um, those gaps? Uh, thank you, Tim, again for these uh, <laughs> very uh, uh, tricky questions. But first of all, uh, condolences to our fellow uh, participants from Morocco, if there are any, because this is was really a uh, a nightmare for for most of most of them and for us also. So, uh, what I can say uh, from our side, 
and actually during the lecture that uh, I delivered, I said that this was the only uh, part of the uh, outer space uh, objectives which we didn't address. Okay, when I say address, we are not at the solution side, but we have analyzed the problems happening there and the gaps. So you're quite right to raise this question because if you look at Africa, the seismic stations, which are recording the seismic activities, they are located mainly in Eastern and Southern Africa. There is a few in West Africa, like Ghana, Nigeria, and Cameroon. Uh, all this is, okay, so-called Africa area network. But um, uh, this, this was uh, actually uh, a team and all our other panelists uh, was a result, what I'm saying here is a result of the studies that we did on PNT infrastructure and technologies in Africa in 2019, if you remember. So there are about 49 seismic stations in Seoul around Africa. Uh, and this is covering 18 countries. But if you look at all the seismic stations, there is actually no GPS station supporting it in most of them. Only 13 of these countries have GPS station co-located with a seismic station or the insult in other location to serve the network. So this is really uh, the gap and um, uh, what we, uh, for which we have to, to, to work. If you uh, now look at the solution, of course, is to fill the gaps in terms of infrastructure. This uh, involves, of course, ensuring that uh, all seismic stations have GNSS station, okay, uh, continuous operating uh, uh, reference station, also collocated with them. So after this, the extension of the seismic network should be considered from the 18 states that uh, we found out took over at least 50% of the total African states uh, in medium term, and maybe 80% uh, in the long term, which is within 10 years. So densification of the current networks used for technical movement monitoring should be also encouraged initiative by those agencies in charge of these networks. So this is what I, uh, we, 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 we can say about it. Of course, the uh, scientific side, I think may, um, we have also to look at more scientific research. Why not from African states, universities uh, to be involved, you know, not only um, uh, specific institutions, but the universities have to play their tune uh, yeah, uh, and, and support uh, like the Afri African array network uh, and by joining they can support these initiatives uh, to uh, revamp the regions where there is uh, identified gaps regarding the uh, EPS station. So uh, on our side we'll continue to raise awareness about this uh, GNSS space technology in Africa. I think recently uh, we had a webinar with GMS in Africa uh, where we were trying to show our expert was showing uh, how the PNT technologies uh, could, could be very useful tools for researchers uh, in to this respect. So, yes, uh, I think many players can be put uh, um, in the loop uh, to support this. Uh, very, very important. It's just a few words, seismic, but uh, when it happens, uh, there is a, a lot of disaster. So I think it's worthwhile looking at it uh, seriously in the near future. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Diov. And I think we'll discuss a bit more about um, disaster management because it's kind of a cross-cutting issue, not only for SAT, for SATNAP, it's also communication, it's also earth observation. Uh, so I think we'll still come back to that. But be, for now, let me call on uh, Dr. Deodene Nsadi Safaka, who is the lead for another program that is currently uh, ongoing, currently in operation. He is a lead for climate services uh in africa to um kind of give us an overview of the program dr faka you have the floor please yeah thank you sir for giving the floor i'm really happy to be with you of course yes we are a program led by the oscps secretariat 
Organization of African, Caribbean, and the Pacific State, based in Brussels. And CLIMSA is uh, one of the 11 EDF funded program. Our main purpose is to build capacity in African, Caribbean, and the Pacific state in terms of generating or transforming data information to services. As you know that uh, metrology is dealing with uh, climate and the weather. All those status is coming from the observation of the space by tracking and the probing the parameter of the atmosphere. We are now at the operational site where we like to see how can we transform the scientific knowledge to the common services to users. So our particularity in the program is to generate science-based information from the state of the atmosphere. This program has got a five result area. The first one, we are trying to set up a platform where users and the producers can meet together and define the tailored program, the program and pro product. Sometimes provider can uh, avail many kinds of data and the product, especially if you can see in the network, but those products are not tailored to the hand user need. So our focus is really to see how can we save our members with the product that meet their requirement. In the science of space, the main challenge is to see that the atmosphere doesn't have a boundary. In terms of the science, you can't allocate the atmosphere to a certain country as we have done with the land. We've got just one envelope, which we call atmosphere, surrounding the whole earth. So we are sharing everything together. And for generating the services, you need to face to look on the global scale as one atmosphere. You make modeling, but to make sense for the small island in Liso, uh, let's say in uh, Seychelles on the Mauritius, that will look like a dot where the satellite image cannot pick on the ground, how can they benefit from, from the climate science? That will come from the techniques we call the downscaling technique, where we get the product from the global scale to downscale to the regional scale until we reach the ground or the community level. All this process, you are losing certain kind of information. So it depends to how your product you are getting from which scale, which, which level. So we are giving more input to see from the global product how African country can use in terms of socioeconomic benefit, such as agriculture, water resource management, infrastructure, and so on. To make it able, the first area of the program is user interface platform, where we can meet with the users. They can tell us their requirement. And from the science-based information to see how can we tailor those information to meet their need. So the user interface platform is where the provider and the user are coming together to define the need and the scientists to generate the product. And the, those user interface platform are well organized in what we call the regional climate centers who are there for downscaling the global product 
to the regional scale so that they can prepare product coming from the numerical weather prediction or the global circulation model to fit at the small scale on ground. The second area of the program is to capacitate countries and the regional climate center in terms of infrastructures that we call the climate services information systems, where we have a four component in that area. The observation that where we got data to observe the atmosphere, to get the status, the parameters and the variable, and to see how those parameters are linked to the socioeconomic activities. To transform data to the information and the services, you need the infrastructure. That way we provide to RCCs some support, the financing support for them to acquire the high, uh, the, the high competing, uh, the high performance competing uh, infrastructure, the IT support, the satellite receiver antennas, and other infrastructure for processing data. The third result area is on data access. As I said that the atmosphere is one, and we have many global producing centers who have, who have got equipment and facilities. So we are trying to link all the assesses. By the way, in Africa, we have five regional climate centers. There are one for the continental level, which we call ACMAT. There is for the West Africa is agreement. We have one for East Africa is ICPAT, the IGAD Climate Prediction and Application Centers. We have one in Southern Africa in Gaboroni, SADC Climate Services Center. We have got one in Central Africa, Climate Application and Prediction Centers in, in Cameroon. And we are trying to build another center in Indian Ocean. For Indian Ocean, they've decided to have the node. So they are going to share among the member states, the four islands, Mauritius, Madagascar, Seychelles, and Comoros, some responsibilities. The fourth area, the, 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 yeah, the, the third area of the, the program, no, should be the fourth. The fourth area is now the capacity building, how we train people and to develop capacity building strategies for them to benefit from what we call South-South collaboration and North-South partnership. So we encourage South-South cooperation as we are dealing with Caribbean and the Pacific, how Africa can learn from Caribbean, they can learn from Pacific and vice versa. And also how the European people can support the global South. And then we have three implementing partners, the technical implementing partners who are helping for building capacity. We've got WMO, the World Metrologic Organization. We've got uh, European Union Joint Center for Research, GRC, based in Italy. And we've got the UMEDSAT with this European Metrological Satellite Organization. They are supporting us in building capacity of RCCs. And the last result area is climate mainstreaming information to policy development and program. Well, we are trying to put together scientists and the policymakers to know exactly how they can use the climate information for developing policy. That is what I can give as uh, the overview of our program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Faka. And um, if, if I can just quickly pose um, one or two questions to you. Um, uh, one of the pillars of the African space uh, policy and strategy is coordination and um, 
harmonization of programs. We don't want duplication. Um, uh, yeah, we want to synergize uh, and streamline. Uh, so, there, so there's this Clean SAP program, which is um, funded by the EU, but there's also the Climb Deaf Africa Initiative or program, which is uh, an initiative of the Africa the Development Bank. So how does the Clean SAP program, how does it interface or align with the Climb Deaf Africa program? Yeah, thank you for that good question. Of course, there is no discrepancies. As you know, that uh, EU, with our main funder, is supporting also African Development Bank. We manage a program called ISASIP, which was also to capacitate the regional climate center. When ADB was uh, the implementing uh, or the, the implementing partners. PIMSA is a follow-up of the previous initiative, ISASIP, SAWIDRA, which was a satellite and a weather information for disaster risk management. In SAWIDRA, under the 11 EDF, the focus on weather information for disaster risk management. Now, when PIMSA came, they extended the range, not only to look on the weather forecast, not to extend to the climate services, which is really extending a bit the range, the scale of the information. So, in short, PIMDEV, PIMSA, is a part of the implementation of African weather and the climate strategy. If you recall that under PIMDEV, they develop the strategy for the development of uh, weather and climate strategy. And the PIMSA is one of the activities implementing that strategy of African ministerial and uh, minister also, whatever you can call the ultimate uh, in short. So we implement uh, the climate strategy on weather in the climate in Africa. Thank, thank you. you, Doctor. Yeah, thank you, Doctor Faka. And um, uh, I, I still have a few other questions, but let me give the floor to uh, Miss Lina Paul first. Thank you, uh, Miss Paul, for your patience. Uh, uh, Miss Lina Paul is a, a research fellow at um, the European Space Policy Institute. Um, uh, having gone through the the programs that are currently in operation, um, we still don't have um, anybody from the AUC yet. I think it's just fitting that we go to a proposed program that is coming up, which is focused more on satellite communication and connectivity. Um, I believe we've, for the participants of the course, I believe we've gone through the video lecture, which was very um, uh, explanatory. So uh, we won't go through all that again, but just for the sake of those who uh, are not participating in the course, we just, uh, Ms. Lina Paul, we just give a, a brief overview of what the Iris Square program is about. Uh, Ms. Paul, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here and um, uh, happy also to, to foster the cooperation between ASLI and S SB. Um, yeah, as introduced already, I'm a um, research fellow at the European Space Policy Institute, SB, and I'm seconded by the German Aerospace Center, DRR. Um, uh, maybe to introduce these two organizations very briefly, SP is the European Think Tank for Space. Uh, it was founded in 2003, so 20 years old. It's uh, something we, we will also celebrate next week. Um, and we were founded by our two founding members, uh, the European Space Agency, ESA, and the Austrian FMG. Um, for this reason, we are located in Vienna and... Um, our mission is really to promote European space policy um, in Europe, but also on a global level. Um, that's why these operations and these exchanges also with ADLI and EU African uh, cooperation space is very interesting and important for us and something we want to further push. Um, and SB is really providing a platform for multiple stakeholders, including policy, economy, media, and academic, academic um, relations. 
Um, then the German Aerospace Center DRR is comprised of the German Space Agency at DRR, um, as well as the Project Management, the National Research Institute for Space and Aeronautics, um, including also other topics like energy, transport, uh, security, and digitalization. Um, so a few words on that. And um, yeah, I had the pleasure to give a lecture on the new European flagship program as part of the EU space program, uh, IRIS Square, which stands for uh, Infrastructure for Resilience, Interconnection, and Security by Satellites. Um, and IRIS Square, this new EU secure connectivity program, um, uh, will be a multi orbit uh, SATCOM constellation, which aims uh, at boosting European satellite based secure connectivity uh, by providing secure and enhanced communication capacities for governmental users, uh, but also has a commercial component um, and aims to ensure high speed internet broadband to remove connectivity dead zones. Um, the program costs are estimated 6 billion uh, to date, and as I said already, it comprises um, governmental and commercial pillar. Um, the, go the governmental pillar is, um, is managed by the European Commission um, and its governmental infrastructure for governmental use, so only for governmental entities. And then there's the commercial pillar, uh, which is commercial infrastructure for both governmental and commercial use. Um, the governmental areas of uh, application areas of Iris Square um, um, are all three security related. Um, it's first the connecting connecting of key infrastructures. A sec second uh, pillar is crisis management and external action, and third is surveillance. Um, then the commercial application areas includes mass market service, uh, including among others, mobile and fixed broadband. Then what's interesting about this project, uh, this program, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a quite new concept for Europe and something that will be pushed forward more and more, it's um, um, the public-private partnership through which uh, this this program will be funded and is governed. And uh, this includes um, out of this total 6 billion, um, a contribution from the EU. As I said, the European Commission is the pro program manager and owner of the governmental infrastructure. And the EU space agency for the space program, EUSPA, is responsible for operational management. Um, the contribution of the EU is uh, uh, 2.5 billion. Then another pillar of contribution or another source of contribution are the EU member states, um, which will in total approximately contribute 1.5 billion. Um, and then there's another, thing, um, which is um, a 2 billion contribution by ESA and the private sector, means the European industry. Um, specifically for ESA at the last ESA Ministerial Council meeting, which uh, took place last year in November, um, a, no, a new program was approved as part of ESA optional programs uh, related to Iris Square and uh, member states of ESA subscribed, um, subscribed with, um, excuse me, I think you're, um, there are a few people unmuted. Maybe you can change that so there are no inter interruptions. Um, so the ESA contribution that was subscribed uh, during the ESA Ministerial Council meeting is 750 million to member state subscription to this new program. Um, a few last words on the timeline. Um, so for now, it's planned, as I said, that line, um, that uh, timeline that um, Iris Square become, will become operational and have full services by 2027. Of course, this is like a very ambitious timeline and we'll see how, how it goes, but that's um, the official um, information that's provided by the European Commission. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ms. Paul. Um, participants who've had um, kind of like overviews of um, the three different programs uh, and from the lecture also. Uh, apologies that we still cannot get um, the one on uh, GPS and Africa. But based on these three, if you have any questions or comments, you can put them on the chat box and I'll present them uh, as we go. Uh, uh, Ms. Paul, let me just ask you, um, 
uh, maybe one or two questions, uh, kind of based on the lecture which you you delivered. Uh, uh, you and you've actually mentioned it here in terms of the in the timeline. Uh, in the lecture, actually, you you said um, I Square is uh, expected to start delivering services by 2024, and then hopefully by 2027 it becomes operational. Uh, similar to the GMES, which started operations first in Europe before it was extended to Africa. So when do you think the Iris squared, uh, the services will now be extended to Africa? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Um, this question is maybe hard to answer because we're not even sure if like the food server and operational service will be on place already in 2027. Um, it's a very ambitious plan, but so far, that's the official plan outlined by the European Commission to have initial services already maybe by end of next year and uh, full operational um, services by 2027. Um, yeah, we will see if everything goes as planned. Um, usually there are always delays uh, that needs to be considered. A reason why already initial services can be provided probably by next year is that um, this program will not like create a new market. We already have a, a strong and developed European market in satellite communication and connect space-based connectivity. So um, we are we are also relying on already existing infrastructure that will be leveraged and um, will comprise the system as a whole. It's um, it's existing, existing infrastructure, um, commercial infrastructure from major European um, satellite companies such as OneWeb and Utilsat, which will merge uh, very, so very soon officially, and SAS. So yeah, the European market is already developed and this program is really um, pushing forward uh, Europeans' position in this market and is using synergies and leveraging the capabilities that are already existing and puts this forward and of course includes also a new infrastructure or developed infrastructure. Um, so yeah, the timeline is quite ambitious. Um, it's, I mean, um, expecting that it, it goes all as planned. I mean, if we consider that the EU legislative process was very quick, um, it all happened in one year that the program was approved. So uh, this went really well and fast. And so considering that, we can maybe be optimistic that we can keep the timeline by 2027. Um, on the other hand, we need to consider that the public-private partnership construct is, um, is quite a new process um, concept for, for Europe to fund. And it will bring, on the one hand, challenges for Europe, um, dealing with all the stakeholders, having the contribution from different funding sources. Um, but on the other hand, it creates also opportunities uh, to strengthen the cooperation within the European space governance framework, mean, namely between the EU, between the ESA, um, between the USPA, USPA as a new agency, between the member states and between the European industry and the private sector. So um, this new construct, um, this new construct can create challenges and opportunities. And um, of course, this depends on that. At the moment, we find uh, we, we find Iris Square and the European uh, Commission's procurement phase in the second phase of that. So a consortium is formed and um, uh, we're in a very early stage of this program. So it's 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 not clear, there's no clear answer to say when the services will be extended to Africa. Um, in, in, in official sources of the European Commission, we can we can see that it's all it's always mentioned in different contexts that Iris Square can uh, serve uh, also for African uh, use and uh, that it's planned to 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 be extended and to use the services in Africa. Um, so yeah, it was for instance confirmed at the European Union African Union Summit in Brussels in 2022. Um, there was a new uh, investment package for to Africa of 150, 150 billion as part of the Global Gateway Initiative, um, which is like EU competitive program to the China uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and this highlighted really uh, cooperation in uh, different areas, including telecom 
including telecommunications. Um, so uh, in this context, uh, Creton, the EU Commissioner for Internal Market, um, really reaffirmed that um, I refer that the EU Secure Connectivity Initiative will be extended, will be extended uh, services for Africa. Um, nonetheless, we have to say that it's still not clear um, when and to what extent it will be extended to Africa. But from SP, from our internal consultations, we don't see any restrictions or limits um, why it shouldn't be and what are like potential blocking points. But this, uh, I can confirm that it's in, in the interest of European policymakers to, um, to define like a joint roadmap with Africa to see how Iris Web can, can fit and serve for African uh, users as well as for European. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Ms. Paul. Uh, thanks for um, that explanation. Uh, participants, please, if you have any questions, please just drop them on the chat box. Uh, I see one question already um, uh, from Brian. He says, um, what is the plan in regards to developing African-based technologies in the different thematic areas. So this is a question for all of you. Uh, what's the plan in regards to developing African-based uh, technology in the different thematic areas instead of just importing, which creates uh, a dependency syndrome on imported technology uh, in response to the indigenous human capital development? So any of you that wants to go first for that? Mr. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, if, if, if I may, I think you, <clears throat> you requested uh, in one of your question about this indigenous, I think it goes into the same way plan, plans. Um, I think it is important also when we are saying Okay, native technologies. I don't like uh, indigenous, as I said, but uh, it is important to say in native technologies. When it comes to developing applications, which are really, I mean, geared to specific requirements in Africa, you can develop from your side. When it comes to bigger programs, like putting a constellation, like a GPS, I mean, First, it is very, very intensive in terms of funding. And second, even if you wanted to do, it will take maybe 10 years and 20 years to acquire that, such technology. So sometimes it is very important to think leapfrogging. And to do leapfrogging, you use a technology. It's technology. It's You are not importing anything else, but it does the job. Okay, and from there, you have to adapt to Africa requirements. So I think this is the most important whenever you import technology. Uh, first of all, it's not guaranteed that you the technology is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is possible to be imported. There are some technologies where we cannot have access to it. So it's already a big, uh, I mean, we are lucky to have this partnership which enables, you know, the two continents, I mean, to uh, benefit from, from each other. So uh, in the case of satellite navigation, we use one of the thematic areas. I think the fact of using European technology could have been uh, the American one, but they both do the same thing. And actually, if you look at Japan, if you look at India and so on, all of them Korean, they used initially uh, the technology either from Europe or from America. So, yes, you have to strive to develop technologies locally, but when you know that this is going to take like 10 years, just go for the program technologies. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Diouf. Um, uh, Dr. Faka, would you like to respond to that question also? Uh, uh, maybe I just modify it slightly. Um, if I want to reference your lecture also, um, one of the comments you made in your lecture was that the OACPS region is the most vulnerable region when it comes to climate change, even though it contributes the least. So um, the issue of local technologies, indigenous technologies, how is are you incorporating that into 
the program that uh, we are currently running. That's into the CLIMSA program. Excuse me, I do not hear. Are you asking? You are giving me the floor. Hello? Yeah. So I was, we, are, we are asking about um, African based technologies. And uh, my question is uh, following up from your lecture also that the OACPS region is the most vulnerable, even though it contributes the least. So how are you trying to incorporate or adopt uh, mm -hmm. African yeah. technologies, indigenous technologies into the high tech um, uh, implementation that you're doing right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course, uh, as I said that we are trying really to see how to tailor those global product to meet the requirement of the users at the African environment or context. We are developing a framework where we learn from our colleague from Pacific, how they are using the traditional indigenous knowledge for fishing. That can help really to manage our resources and also to develop some services according to their own experience in the Caribbean and the Pacific. So the first thing we are trying to see is how can we make a database of the traditional indigenous knowledge for use? You know, sometimes when we are dealing with the forecast, our ancestors, grandparents used to do a their own way of observing the weather and some other indicators. So we are thinking that by building that uh, database, we can document it, all those information and try to see how with the scientific modern data could help to bridge the gap where the science cannot give us a good trend to foresee what will happen tomorrow. That is the way we are building really the indigenous knowledge in Africa to match with the modern system of observing weather and climate. In terms of indigenous initiative, we are trying to align the global product to the local conditions so that the product can be really relevant because today, we can't consider, for example, in the socioeconomic uh, environment for the well-advanced countries. You know, for example, in our case, we have what we call the informal economy, which does not pay taxes, but support the livelihood of many peoples. Sometimes those are the factors the modern science cannot put in to respond to the need of those who are dealing with the informal economy. And we are also developing a socioeconomic model for climate services, where it will be now take in account the informal economy, which is not a part of the global socioeconomic models, so that it can really inform well the decision makers in our own environment and conditions. That is the way we are trying really to meet user need, user requirement in their context. That the big mission for us, tailor global provision knowledge to the local condition. That's how I can put on, on your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Faka. And um, there's another question for you while I still have you. We talk it's a question about the CLIMSAP program, um, taking into account the, the African socioeconomic landscape. How can we balance the service value chain, which was also described in your lecture? How do we balance that between the business profitability and the non profitable um, sector or so mm -hmm. Yeah, the first challenge we have is you know that the climate information used to be considered as a public good, where they don't 
account for a value. We give everything for free. For free. That's the first challenge. Now with the new concept of the climate services, making profit, it means we need to set up a new framework where climate and weather information will become an input on the, on the profits. How to move from public good to the commercial good. There is no law. There is no guideline in that area. It is a new area. If you yourself or you would like also to come in to see how can we develop our climate services in the context we use only to receive the public good instead of the social, the commercial good. That will make us really to think about the question, the profitability of the services of the socioeconomic profile with the climate services coming in. Because for many years, climate information was not counted as a commercial need, a commercial good, but now we need to bring it in because the private sector should come in and they need also to get the benefit of their investment. This is the new area we need really to redefine the purpose or the mission of the weather services in our countries. Should they continue as a public good or should they involve also the commercial good? For that one, it will increase, also improve the quality, the accuracy of the forecast so that it can be really count as economic factors. And I would like maybe to have more other discussions with the colleague who raised that question to see how can we set up a framework, climate services for profitability or climate services for social economic benefits. Okay, Th thank you, Dr. Faka. Um, there's also there's another question for all of you again. Uh, it talks about um, the ultimate goal of your program, which again comes down to the issue of uh, local. Uh, if I may, let me, if I follow the leading of Mr. Samor, it does not like the using of the word indigenous. So the building of local African capabilities. Uh, the question is: Are we trying to support the building local capability, or is it just a matter of trying to adopt the EU technology? Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know. Where do I start with Miss Paul? If you want to respond to that, what is the ultimate goal of the like the Iris Square program that is coming up? Uh, what is the ultimate goal of that program? So for Iris, Iris Square, right? Okay. Yeah, for Iris um, Square. Yeah. Yeah. The the goal of the program is to provide a secure, a satellite based secure connectivity in Europe and beyond. So to leverage European um, existing infrastructure to provide new infrastructure and create a multi orbit constellation um, to remove dead zones to serve a governmental secure connectivity needs. Yeah, that's. Let's say in a nutshell, the goal of the program. Okay, uh, will the program facilitate the development of any um, capabilities within Africa? Yeah, the, the program can be extended to Africa and can serve to remove also uh, connectivity dead zones in Africa and provide internet to, uh, in Africa. But this is really something uh, that needs to be further defined. We're in the early stage of this program, and um, it's 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 a defined goal by the European Commission to provide connectivity services in Africa. It's not yet further defined because we're in an early stage um, how and to what extent. But this is uh, definitely one of the ambitions and goals that in this program are defined. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Diof, uh, I, I know in your lecture you've already mentioned um, uh, about this issue of developing the local capability, local s bar system, but maybe you want to shed some more light on how you are going about that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tim. I think it's a good question um, that was brought again on the table. Um, I think regarding satellite navigation and mainly s bus um we can divide into two 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 uh, two parts huh? the first thing is capacity building uh, first 
when you enter into this very specialized uh, uh, domain of satellite navigation, you can you can see that only a, a few uh, big countries have a constellation and so on. First thing is to go for capacity building because once you have done the capacity building, okay, you can decide. Otherwise, I mean, you decide on maybe wrong assessment and so on and so forth. So I think the first objective should be knowledge. Knowledge to know and know to make sound decision afterwards. Okay, the second thing, the second part of the program is for those who have enough information uh, about the technology, the benefits and so on, how to support them for the implementation. This is also another ball game that has to work um, uh, where you have to go through. And secondly, uh, thirdly, sorry, you have to be able to promote the service because you can have the infrastructure in place, yet the users uh, have not adopted. So the last part is really the adoption and use of services. So I think, um, in, in 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 all these uh, different steps, what you want to make you have to make sure is what the people say about local content. So the local content is really to build an African expertise capability uh, uh, to implement same services, the same performance, similar performance that are in Africa, in uh, America, or in in Europe. So. Uh, it's not a question of saying, oh, it's not, um, it's uh, imported from Europe or whatever. You just have uh, to know uh, the, the need, the capability of Africa to fund such big project or not, and the need to do it in a very, uh, I mean, that your time to market is, is reduced as much as possible. Yeah, we can do a lot of things locally, indigenously, by taking time, but what is the need if uh, the service is coming in 20 years? It's not, it's not, it is now that Africa has to catch the gap in terms of space, uh, wherever they are, whether it's satellite navigation or in Earth observation or even communication in general. So I, 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 I hope I answered to, to that question, but it's, it's very, very important. I think um, people who are talking some time about it do not know the complexity of the technology. Uh, even for Europeans, they took uh, like 10 years before developing it. So uh, this is a case, not, not something else. It has no political touch or whatever. It's the use and the need. And that's what we have to look at. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Diof. Uh, I, I, another issue that is also cross-cutting across all the programs is the issue of data. So each of the programs, all the programs are acquiring data from and about Africa, some are from satellites, some are in situ. So there are the issues about security, privacy, ownership, governance. Uh, so I just want each of you to also talk about how, uh, when it comes to data, how you're handling these different issues privacy, governance, uh, security, uh, and access even for uh, Africa. Um, who wants to go first? Uh, Dr. Faka? Yes, sorry. Yeah, of course for data, that is a big challenge as I raised during my presentation or my lecture. Data sharing is a constraint for us because uh, people are not sharing data. Member states are not sharing data, and we can't do our work in the way, in the good manner. Because as I explained, the scientific basic that we need to downscale the global to the regional scale, and to downscale the regional scale to national scale, you need the local data. But when it's when it's come now to African government or the national the meteorological and the hydrological services, data is not for free. All the African countries have not yet signed that uh, resolution of a WMO on public uh, good 
data sharing uh, resolution. So it's making really us a bit tough and challenging. How can we really do work in a good manner? If member state can allow or the government decision makers, because the member, the National Meteorological Department are complaining to say that they are the least funded services in the government structure. If they make the data for free, they are gonna lose even the small amount of cost recovering they are getting from those data. What is my contribution? If at the policy level, any investment coming in the country could allocate it even to 0.1% to the network for the observation of climate information and to finance those institutions, I think they will not resist to make it available for everyone. That is my contribution to say, is it a way to have a law helping each government to assign, to allocate it a certain amount for data gathering, data observation, gathering and processing. So that it become now really a public good because they are receiving support even for the international community. And those data will no longer be coming something like depending to their uh, income, but really helping the community how to prepare for climate resilient society. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Faka, but I want to press you a little bit more. So assuming the government gives the needed support and now data is made available and is now shared and made accessible, how secure is that data? Um, how accessible to those who have shared the data to the users and to the communities? How accessible is it for them both now and in the future? Who, uh, who lays um, claim ownership to the data? Uh, are yeah, there problems for this within the governance of the CLIMSA program? Yeah, for the governance of a CLIMSA, the data belong to the member state. So we, we don't change any role on the data governance. We bring our technology and we say to people, look, to get the right product, you need to input your own data so that you can get the tailored products. If you provide that information, you will get back the result. If you don't provide, what we are going to do, we are going to use know-how, the free data, which is the global scale, which is not really in terms of the quality or the resolution, is not really a good resolution. It will not give you a good downscale product. Because many people up to now, they are using the global scale product on the network, on the website, without incorporating the ground data, which is coming from the local condition to tell those products and to reduce sometimes the bias the uncertainty. So for the data issue up to now, we have not yet really found a solution for that one. We are expecting that if data can become free, any government to put data available for the science, for them to generate a product that will help us to move forward. But so far for Africa is not yet, and we don't have yet any solution. Maybe we can get any proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Faka. Uh, Ms. Paul, I'll, I'll come to you now. Uh, by the time the I risk a, um, program is rolled out Europe and then to Africa. Of course, voice, um, video, data also will pass through these communication networks, possibly from Africa to Europe. So the question again, the same question that I asked uh, Dr. Faka, the issue of security of the data, the issue of ownership of the data, the issue of um, even access uh, and uh, privacy distribution, what are the governance mechanisms that um, are being considered within the IRI squared program? 
Yeah, thank you for this question. So indeed, um, it's it's still to be seen how how Iris Square will um will be connected to security, and in how far it will integrate military needs, in how far um it will be used for security applications. As I presented earlier, the governmental pillar of the program um has three sub pillars um, that are security related to uh, connection of key infrastructures, the crisis management and external action and surveillance. Um, and um, um, it's still to be, to be discussed because there are different opinions also between you member states um, in how far Iris will be used for security. Um, but of course it's, it's part of the envisaged, envisaged structure. So this is still a point of discussion. With regards to security of information um, and that data privacy, um, even the commercial pillar, like the commercial applications, um, are supposed to be really secure, um, provide secure connectivity. Um, and um, in line with this trend that we can see that increasingly commercial infrastructures, commercial space assets are used for security. Um, uh, always, of course, increases also the need for for Iris Square to provide uh, secure connectivity um, in um, also for the commercial part. Um, the system itself will rely really on disruptive technologies, including quantum. It will also be part of the QKD initiative, um, the program in U on quantum key distribution. Uh, which is um, um, really uh, reinforces the cybersecurity and um, uh, the se secure communication. Um, so that's uh, for both pillars envisaged that it's secure communication. And with regards to data privacy, the EU has a very uh, put very much emphasis on uh, data privacy policy and uh, has like high standards in terms of that. So we can assume that in line with that, Iris Square as a new program uh, will be in line with EU data privacy policy and standards and therefore um, will take care of data privacy um, and secure security of information. Um, as I said, we cannot talk about things that are not in place yet. It's an early stage of the program, but that's um, that's what we can expect for Iris Square. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I guess it, this is also something that's to be defined between European and African uh, space policy uh, policy leaders um, to find a joint roadmap to to put this in place and to ensure data privacy and uh, security of information. Um, yeah, this is also part of the Global Gateway Initiative and uh, something that yeah we can expect that uh, EU standards and um, policy on data privacy uh, will be applied. Excellent. Uh, th thank you, Ms. Paul. And um, there's actually another, there's a question here in the chat box for you. Uh, it says, uh, you mentioned in your lecture that um, Africa, uh, and actually you said Africa and the Arctic region, that they are geographical areas of interest uh, to the EU. Uh, so the uh, Chipo wants you to expand shit on that. What do you mean by uh, Africa and Arctic region as um, geographic areas of interest? Okay, yeah, so, so that's uh, that's defined by the European Commission. Um, yeah, well, it's um, as I said, the from the technological solutions, it's uh, the constellation will be able to provide connectivities in this area. So the question is why we should not use this um, this um, technical solution that will um, will enable the north and south polar. Uh, orbits, uh, so we can we can use the connectivity where where we can. So that's, I guess, what's meant by that. But it's again, this is defined by the European Commission. Um, and yeah, and of course, the cooperation with Africa uh, in several initiatives in space uh, with regards to any applications like Earth observation, uh, satellite communication, and um, all the application areas, and even maybe in the future, much more beyond, uh, is is of interest of the EU. So yeah, I hope this answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you, Miss Paul. And um, as we begin to run the, down the the program, uh, let's quickly talk about the EU. Uh, AU, EU, or Africa, EU space relations, since um, the programs we are discussing, they are primarily um, funded by the EU. And in uh, Mr. 
some idea of the lecture. He actually gave an historical background starting as far back as the EU, Africa EU summit in 2000 and, uh, and subsequent uh, action plans and subsequent uh, summit. So for each of you, uh, I, I want you to place the program you're running in the context of E Africa, EU, space relations or space partnership, what's your assessment of the current status and then um, how can the partnership uh, be strengthened? Um, Mr. Diof, do you want to go first? Uh, sorry, thank you, uh, Etim. Um, I just wanted to rebound on um, the, 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 in the question that you had before about data availability of uh, before moving to this one, but very quickly. Uh, just to say that uh, regarding satellite navigation, it's all about positioning, navigation, and timing. So what do you say uh, the data in Earth observation? For us, it's a question of infrastructure coverage. That's all. And you have the uh, seg uh, space segment, and you have the ground side. Uh, so the service at the end is divided into two kinds. Uh, service where there is safety of life, okay? There, if there is security, it's like aviation, like maritime, like rail, okay? And if you take aviation, for instance, if there is any problem for any reason, a satellite that is not in line of sight or something like that, the pilot himself is or herself is advised, okay? Within six seconds so that he doesn't use. So security really is at 100%. So, um, I think that is what I just wanted to 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 say, and the the the, the real uh, uh, requirement for 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 Africa is to put up this uh, infrastructure uh, the same way it has been uh, um, installed or implemented in the other uh, continents. That is a very safe architecture with master control centers and so on and so forth. So just to uh, add on, on, on that last question, before moving to our thoughts on Africa-EU space relations, in this case of uh, augmented uh, satellite uh, navigation, uh, for, for me, it's not because I'm working here. I have worked in many other areas before coming in here. Uh, but this Africa-EU strategy was fundamental to the progress and success made in this area. I think without this, we would not be able to uh, make the uh, the progress that we have made. And I wanted to insist in one thing, the possibility of technology transfer. Again, um, it's not granted that technology transfer is allowed from EU to Africa. So this was something very important. Um, and there is an international agreement that was uh, defined with uh, a SECNA, for instance, to use the EGNOS technology. So. This is something really um, that shows how far uh, the cooperation with uh, other continent can, can help, and this, in this case, European Union. So I think this uh, Africa-EU relations uh, should be continued in this domain uh, while focusing in African needs. And I wish that when the African Space Agency is in, on stage, that they will also maintain this direction to foster the development of uh, positioning, navigation, and timing application in the continent for the benefits of all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Diouf. Um, Dr. Faka, you want to say something about EU-Africa space relations, um, especially within the context of um, cooperation in uh, climate change. Where do you see the, what's the current status from your view? How can we Strengthen it. Okay, um, I'm not sure he's there. Okay, okay. Miss Paul, would you like to respond? Your, especially from the EU perspective now, uh, your assessment. Sorry, of EU... I did not get you. Sorry, sorry, I did not uh, get you a bit. Okay, I, we, we are discussing the Africa EU space partnership, the mm -hmm. current status, and uh, especially from your uh, area of work within the cooperation. Uh, yeah, climate change. Um, how is it going? How can we improve on it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we, we are dealing with um, UMETSAT. Uh, you see, UMETSAT is a European program for the meteorological satellite, which is trying really to assist the uh, African Union in uh, dealing with um, some facilities 
as you know that uh, the third generation of our satellite which was launched i think the last year most of the data are focused on africa of course the satellite is really focused on africa and uh, they are really providing the support to african country to use uh, all of those uh, remote sensing uh, data for now EU is really keen to continue assisting African country with the meteorological satellite event, the Sentinel, and so on. But at the EU site, I think they are also having a, a program for the satellite-based products. In terms of partnership, at my program, there is no a challenge because UMETSAT is part of, is a part of the implementing partners. They are providing data. They are providing a software for dealing with the processing of those data. They're also installing some, what we call the, the receiver antennas. So in terms of partnership, EU, AUC, things are really moving as planned. So far, there is not any challenge I can share in this platform. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Faka. Uh, Ms. Paul? Your thoughts about EU EU space uh, partnership? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, as I said, in 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 with regards to Iris Square and the uh, secure connectivity, um, we are in early stage of the program, so we need to see where where it goes. But I'm quite optimistic, and I I really see that EU that it's the right time, and that we, today we can see. There's really a boost in Africa-EU relationship, and um, we at SB we really want to be part of that. And um, it's also um, as we're promoting space policy on a global level, um, and we would like to um, uh, foster our cooperation with ASLI as well. It's uh, really something uh, we want to dive in and see uh, how this can be further pushed. Um, but we can see already um, from from your perspective, um, like that. For instance, the, the African Space Agency, which was anywhere, right, it uh, really puts a good baseline for future cooperation. Then for satellite communication, Iris Square can really be a part of the EU Global Gateway Initiative and really can be imp impactful in this initiative. But there are several other um, initiatives that were started recently or that uh, where we can see there's enhanced cooperation. For instance, the EU Global Action on Space Initiative, it can really be an instrument for enhanced cooperation between Africa and the EU. Um, then uh, there are several, several uh, conferences, for instance, in April, the New Space Africa Conference with European uh, participation, um, which was really a crucial event and saw uh, the EU and the African Union uh, moving one step further in, in their partnership. Um, then, for instance, in, in Earth Observation, uh, the EU Space Agency for the program around the USPA organized an Af Europe, Europe Africa Space Earth Observation uh, high level forum in, in the summer uh, to, to see Africa's full EU potential for, with the EU uh, synergies. And as you might know, USPA is very, um, um, you, See, looks at the user driving approach. So um, starting with an up and bottom up approach to see what our user needs and really try to link African user needs with uh, with capabilities we can provide through the EU space program. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very optimistic that uh, the Africa EU relations in space will be further pushed um, also through IR Square, but also to other uh, programs and. So far, the cooperation is mainly in the application areas, and I think it can go beyond and would be good to see that it goes beyond that also in other space-related missions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Paul. And um, I think I was I think I, I just want us to pause at this point because if we go on, we may overshoot the time, and I don't want us to go over the time because of our, our different schedules. So um we've had uh, a couple of discussions uh, uh given background starting with um uh, the beginning of the eu au formal cooperation in uh, 2000 we've talked touched on different aspects of that program uh we've talked on uh, issues of data we've talked on issues of technology transfer 
um, and the different aspects. So I, I think we with this we have a, 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 a well, well I, I, let me say a fair, if not all of yeah, a better understanding of EU Africa space relations and partnership and then um, where it could be in future. And I actually think um like um I think Semo, the Mr. Semo you mentioned earlier on if we could have this kind of forums where the different uh, leads or representatives of the different programs come together to talk openly, um, not just the private. I know there's a meeting coming up next month. I think it's in Brussels, but that's kind of um, private, so to say. We want to have this open discussion where uh, other Africans, other Europeans can know what's going on and um, what role they can play. And um, I think it will be very beneficial. So I think we'll, we will also see how we can uh, go on with this. So I want to thank all our panelists and the facilitators for the lectures. I went through all the lectures and I really learned quite a lot. And uh, so on behalf of myself and on behalf, on behalf of the participants, I really want to thank you for your time, for the knowledge you've shared, and also coming again today to interact uh, with um, with us. So I really want to say thank you to everybody, Mr. Simodio, Dr. Faka, uh, Ms. Lina Paul, and um, all the participants that were able to make it today. Um, thank you, and um, have a very good uh, evening. And thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.